Hello, thank you for listening to the New Afternoon Show. Um, I'm Ethan. I've been, you've been listening to my show. Um, this is in the past, but it is the present now as I am talking. Um, I'm here with Matt. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? Hey, how's it going, all you violet? Uh, sunny afternoon out there today. I'm trying to get my radio <laughs> voice going. Uh, no, we, we, we've heard the NPR like... You were listening to NPR. Yeah, I was on NPR. Oh, really? Yeah, and um, afterwards, one of the the bassists of Magruder Grind got a text message from his mom that just said, you should check out the website, (laughs) thehardtimes.net. So that's the NPR effect. Um, So I should probably introduce who you are. You are the... Or could we leave it as a mystery? Just they all know? Maybe I'm I'm like the new intern. Uh, What's the name of the president of your school? Andrew Hamilton. I heard Andrew Hamilton's embezzling a lot of money. Did you guys hear that? That's a rumor going around campus. <laughs> we cannot confirm or deny that. Um, we can. Uh, I can confirm it. What's the name? Uh, w N Y U can confirm. We've got sources on the inside. Andrew Hamilton is his name. Andrew Hamilton. A- Andy Andrew. That sounds like a uh, sounds like a founding father. You're right. Um, yeah. Is it? Is it like his great great grandson? It wasn't. What, what, that's Alexander Hamilton, uh, right? I don't know that that name being president seems to me like there's some corruption afoot. I think we should investigate. I there probably is. <laughs> I cannot confirm or deny, though. I can say I'll confirm it. It's a, it's a <laughs> the largest private um, college in America, so probably. But I can. Yeah. I won't say. How much student loan debt do you have? Um, personally. Yeah. N- um, not much. Ooh, I'm good. So not I'm, much. Luck- I'm on the lucky end, but NYU is notorious for giving out very little money. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people get pay like two hundred thousand dollars to study film or something like that. I've had a couple friends who did that. It's not worth it. No. Um, as much as I enjoy myself. If, if you're listening to this right now and you have two hundred thousand dollars worth of student loan debt and you are a film major, please abandon the country, move to <laughs> France. You will never or vote for Bernie. Yeah, that might work. Um, I also co-signed that message. Um, but, yeah, so you are the editor-in-chief of the Hard Times. I used to be. I was the uh, editor-in-chief of Hard Times for about four and a half years, and I recently uh, handed over that title to my main man, Bill Conway. Bill Conway is my co-founder. Uh, now my title is CEO. I wear a suit. If you're listening to us on the radio, I'm wearing a suit right now. Uh, very domineering personality. Yes. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I moved over because I started a new company called Outvoice, which is trying to help publishers pay their freelance content creators more efficiently. And so I wanted to really put my entire effort into that. So I didn't want to be the editor in chief anymore. So Bill Conway stepped up, but I'm still in all the editorial meetings and vote on all the headlines. So, um, yeah, hard times is my baby. It'll never not be my baby. <laughs> That's a good effort though. Otherwise, cause obviously freelancers kind of get screwed over a lot. Do you get paid to be on the radio? Um, as a m- member of the management um, team, we get paid a stipend, but to actually broadcast... Oh, a member of management over here, dude. Everyone else has to unionize. Um, I, I would support <laughs> it. I, I know, I would support it. That's great, you get a stipend. I was on the I was on the college newspaper, I didn't get a stipend. Um, yeah. I went to SF State, though, I guess it's a little different than NYU. <laughs> no, you don't get a stipend at the newspaper either. It's, oh, really? Um that's a whole different issue. Is there a satire magazine here? Yeah, uh, technically. Yeah? <laughs> Not very good. <laughs> you heard it here first. WNYU thinks the satire magazine on campus is not very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's my I'll, it's my personal opinion. I went to a couple meetings. What's it, it was, called? That's also a good question. Um, the, the Violet Weekly. I was on the uh, parody newspaper in high school. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What was, was that one called? It was called The Oat. We were a friend's school. Okay. So, Quaker. You speak Quakers. French? Friends. Oh, friend school. Like Quakers. Huh? What's a friend school? The Quakers. You don't know the Quakers? I mean, Quaker Oats. Yeah, that's why it was called Quaker. That was why Wait, was Quakers the like the old school. Were those people who invented prisons? Like, no, you, like you had the to, opposite. You had to put like, them. They're kind of like p- peace loving, nonviolent types. I thought it was some original people who landed in the U.S. some of the colonizer people who invented the idea of a jail cell where it was like God's light was supposed to shine down on you. There was no roof to it. 
and they're supposed to like cure you through God or something like that. So I mean, they Quaker do have the, the light of God as a common phrase in Quakerism, but I, they don't sound like the prison types. They generally mm. aren't, but they were Pennsylvania. What is Quakerism about? I don't know anything about it. Um, their whole philosophy is like, there's that of God in everyone. Mm -hmm. um, they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Just establishing it here. Um, they... I can tell you this much. There's not the light of God in Andrew Hamilton. He's been embezzling money <laughs> from this school for decades. Allegedly, no possibly. One has, no one has stood up, but that comes to an end uh, next week, we Saturday, Saturday, Union Square. We're all going to march against them. Um, there is no march. <laughs> there are a lot of marches. That That is not one of them. Well, <laughs> you, you can, can say that, but I'd say there's a march. It's just you and by I'll yourself. I got, I got my people, my violets out there. <laughs> uh, well, though the Quakers are cool. They're like peace dudes. They were all. They were like the first. Some of the first abolitionists. Cool. Um, the, their whole thing is like silence and medi um, in meeting for worship. Anyone can speak. They have no like pastors or. So anything. there's no Quaker radio out there. Um. No. No. There's no Quaker rock either, uh -huh. but I would be very down to listen to it. It would probably probably be more um, punk than any Christian punk, um, mm. more punk than MXPX. Or... <laughs> Isn't MXPX like coming back? I feel like every pop yeah. punk band is coming back. They're probably playing they're fast. I don't know. They're the ones like, uh, come and take me by the hand. Let's go see the punk rock band. Yeah. yeah. That's MXPX, right? Yeah. All right. They, um, they suck. <laughs> they're, not, they're, they're actually fine. It's like going back. They just kind of sound like Mr. T experience, kind of that mm. vein of pop punk. Mm. What do you guys play here on um, the show? Do you play, you play music? Yeah, I play. I'm, I'm, I've been in bands, but um, per, what, what type of bands? Uh, you know, just kind of rock, punk, garage stuff. Cool. You know. Do you play your own music on repeat? Yes, that's my my show. It's uh, that why very got self indulgent. Into, that's why you got into the whole radio thing. Just yeah, to just, put your own records just on. to promote myself. Three hours of my EP on loop of my broken up band. I see you guys have a drum set here. You guys have bands play live yeah, on the we radio. We do have bands play live. I played live on the radio a couple times when I used to play in bands. Oh man, it always sounded like trash. We were too loud, <laughs> so it just came through like a chainsaw. We're pretty good at recording. We, yeah. we have a lot of loud bands. We've had a lot. You know, we've had basically most of the punk bands it through it's pretty wild like awesome. through the archives um you know and any of the big hardcore bands you know cool um, all the youth group bands came through really i think youth of today like premiered something like their first ep on wnyu really or something. yeah that's awesome there's a legacy show crucial chaos which um is pretty legendary in the punk scene basically all of all of the major hardcore bands of the 80s crucial chaos yeah cool yeah it's still on. You tell me either today played in that room or a different no, room? No, different room. We've moved locations. Moved. All right. Um, I've had, no, but you can, we've let's, had cool bands in this space, though. All right, and let's cut to you today live <laughs> from WNYU. Um, I'm not going to go through that for defining that in the archive. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the hard times and... Okay. Um, you, if that's okay. Let's do it. I'm kind of curious what your background is because, and it's such a, uh, every, everyone in music kind of has their own backstory. I feel like how they found out about things and kind of join, join mm -hmm. the quote unquote scene. I'm doing air quotes, but sure. we're on radio, so you can't um, see air quotes. Uh, I'm kind of curious w w where you're from how you got started in your scene, if you were part of that scene where you're from or if it happened later. I had an older brother, Ed. He got me into punk music. Uh, he started taking me to shows. I went to go see Catch-22, The Addicts, Clip 45, uh, at The Pound and Gilman and a whole bunch of other places in the Bay Area. That was actually, I was pretty young. I was in elementary school. Oh, wow. Um, started playing drums, joined a couple bands. Grew up going to shows at Gilman. Um... I'm a little weird because punk's been kind of my whole life. There was like one of my first interests in elementary school was I like the Ramones. Yeah. That was my AIM screen name, the Ramones 122. Um, so yeah, I've always been just like a punk kid. And then eventually I got into making zines. And uh, then I went to journalism school and I got some news writing skills. And so I decided to take my comedy punk zine and mix it up with my news writing skills. 
and uh, teamed up with my co-founder Bill, and that's how Hard Times got started. Um, what were some of, like the early bands besides the Ramones that your brother like showed you? Was it mostly San Francisco bands, or was it kind of just all? Well, yeah, like there's like Bay Area bands like Rancid was huge. Oh yeah, um, that was a big Operation Ivy, uh, but also a lot of '80s hardcore stuff, so like Minor Threat and like um, Black Flag, Negative Approach. That sort of stuff and actually my youth was uh i don't know am i still youth i'm 28 you're, you're within the youths okay I would say. well when i was younger um i actually got into you know the smaller more obscure hardcore bands before i got into the bigger punk bands. so i was more like listening to the necros and stuff like that uh because my older brother had already done all the digging and was throwing mm -hmm. uh bands at me uh so yeah, now that I'm a little older, I can kind of go in reverse and end up listening to Good Charlotte. But it's like I never <laughs> listened to them when I was younger. But are you excited for MCR coming back? Uh, no, you weren't. You're not a no. But Good Charlotte, though. No, yeah. I actually had a song in high school in one of my punk bands that was like against My Chemical Romance, um, which is so cool, man. That is so, so mature. high school punk. Yeah. Um, are you? Excited about uh, no. MCR? I never was into them. I was more into like the Blink One Eighty Two yeah, like side of things. Yeah, Green um, Day. The guys from Green Day just asked for our book. I just sent it to nice. them. Nice. Which yeah. um, all of the guys are just. Um, Trey Cool has followed us for a very long nice. time, and Mike Durnt was the guy who reached out and said that he wanted uh, a book. So I sent him enough for books for all of them to have green day was like my entry point really um yeah, it's pretty cool that they support our website like that they'll they'll yeah. comment on our posts from oh, time to time nice. yeah. that is fun um that was they were kind of the foundational band and then i i read a book about them and mm -hmm. <laughs> when i was a young teen and from there it was like oh up ivy and then i got i'm from dc so i got more into the dc hardcore mm -hmm. stuff and so it was kind of the entry point that stuff's important do you know the band good clean fun are they a dc band the dc band late 80s it's like a satirical hardcore band but they're funny and good and uh i ended up starting a company with the guy who was their oh, lead fun. singer do you, know if he was, Isa. do you know if they had what are like some of their like related acts because all of these dc bands are very like um, hmm. incestuous hmm that's a good question i don't know the answer to that question um yeah, I don't know. It was a little bit later. It was like after, like Minor Threat and all those bands, and people were like felt like hardcore was dead or whatever, you know. And, I mean, that was already sort of like you know, emo and post hardcore in DC. So mm -hmm. kind of the hardcore scene had kind of moved a bit to the back at that point, even. Yeah, they were like a satirical hardcore band. They had some really good lyrics, um, but uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll ask Issa about that. It's a good question. Okay, I'm curious because. I feel like to be in a DC band, you have to have D four D other DC bands. Yeah, somehow. probably. You know, d just everyone wants to be Ian McKay with like 10 bands. <laughs> um, but so when the website started out, I, I think I saw the first article or something on social media and it just immediately blew up, I feel like. Was that on your side, the experience? or? Uh, yeah, you know, it kind of was. Um, we had worked on the website in private for about three months. Uh, we took about 18, uh, we took about $800 and we had bought, uh, websites and logos and tried to make it look very official. And, uh, we launched our site. I think we had six articles when we first launched and then we had enough for one a day for a couple of weeks. We thought consistency would be important mm -hmm. and we started putting them out and it was, it was a pretty quick rise. Now, it wasn't just like we made a website and just everyone rushed right to it, but it was like we put out our first article and it went viral, and then our second article went viral, and then the the amount of viralness to it just kept growing. You know what I mean? So we, our first article, like 20,000 people would read it, and our second article would be like 30, then 40, then 50. And then you know, there was like a, there was over a million people reading our wow. stuff in the first month. And uh, I think last month it was... 5 million views and about 2.5 to 3 million unique people. Wow. Um, but that's the people who actually got to the website. Uh, there's like about 120 million uh, people who see our stuff via social media. Wow. How, yeah. 
because it's such a niche idea, and a lot of those early articles were, you know, some they were they weren't about like very obscure things, but they it is such a niche audience. Why do you think it so immediately hit off? Well, there was a anyone who's trying to start a creative project should really try to think up uh, who their target audience is, but then you should Google the term uh, "total addressable market." It's like a it just kind of means there was no one doing there was no one serving the people who we wanted to serve and so they were very passionate and they evangelized on our behalf and then once they did that for us which we're obviously forever grateful for we were able to continue to broaden our scope of uh content and uh, topics to the point where now you know half of our traffic is related to video games um which is another big um part of my life besides punk but you know, you have we we grew with our audience. It's not that 120 million people on social media are laughing at jokes about DIY basement shows. Yeah, it's just that the people who are running the website all went to DIY basement shows, and yeah. that's where they got their start. I feel, the first article I remember just being like, "This hit so hard." Was the Ian Mackay gets ready for another day of interviews or something? Oh yeah, thanks. That's mine. Oh really? Um. Because I, I actually... Well, you know what? I think it's mine. I, I always forget. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's mine, and I'm pretty sure the reason why I wrote it was because uh, I love DC Hardcore and uh, Minor Threat, and I just watched so many documentaries about it, and it's just kind of funny to think about how many documentaries those guys are in. Yeah. I actually interviewed Ian McKay when I was in college for my punk scene. He was very generous with his time, so yeah. it's kind of funny for me then to turn around and uh, make fun of how many times he's in documentaries. But there's actually a really funny... Well, I in that article we talk about him appearing in like a a, ba- a minor league baseball documentary, <laughs> just like just talk talking about how the team like made their own uniforms or whatever. Because he's always telling he's always telling that story about how they made their own seven inches, and you know we were learning, man. We had to glue glue them up and fold them and learn how to do it. Uh, Ian McKay is obviously a very huge influence on yeah. me, uh, especially not even just in a music way, but in a business way. I uh, admire the way he was able to grow a sustainable business out of something that he found interesting and uh, he was able to do it himself and he still works on it really hard. That's something I kind of want hard times to be like. Yeah. I have, I've actually interviewed Ian too. And cool. it just, I just feel like everyone has. <laughs> it's he's almost very, like everyone has. He's very accessible yeah. and very generous with his time and very insightful. Yeah. Then a very nice human, yeah. human being. And it is, he is kind of, especially growing up in DC, he is like the, the model of how to do it it's interesting to think about how much influence he's had on Mm -hmm. culture um partially because of his bands and the legacy of his bands but also because of his willingness to have one-on-one interactions with people yeah for sure you know what i mean like he actually really did influence my life in our conversation and uh it's interesting to think about how many times he's probably done that and how many individual people he's impacted right. in that way. And he doesn't, I mean, he probably doesn't. It's even, like a ripple effect. I mean, sure. how many do those people impact? A hundred people talk to Ian McKay. Yeah, his and, thought process has uh, been very widespread. Yeah. Straight edge, very influential, but then For also sure. just DIY stuff, very influential. I was talking with my friend about this actually yesterday, and I find it so interesting how straight edge specifically has blossomed completely beyond um, punk even mm-hmm. not just Ian and he just probably wrote that song like in a day and wasn't even really thinking it, he was just talking about himself is what mm-hmm. I find the most interesting thing is and now it's like so many people ascribe to this philosophy that he just was like this is what I do one of the things that I think is interesting is that I'm pretty sure his dad was like a preacher or a pastor or something like that and um, I wonder how much his father influence him to mm. be able to uh influence a crowd yeah you know what i mean because we all kind of learn a big part of life is you just mimic your parents and i wonder if uh his dad's ability to get people motivated via speaking to an audience is something that ian picked up from him yeah for sure i'm also curious what you think about why there was such a need for this because i feel when i saw it i felt like why doesn't this exist Uh and i was an immediate i feel like so many other people are like finally someone's saying what i've been meaning to say or wanting to say 
and making jokes that I feel I get. This is for me. Why do you think there was such a such a lack of it and then such a need for it and then yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Why didn't it exist? You know, there were some things kind of like it that existed. There were some social media pages that um, yeah. I found about later that were just headlines. A lot of memes, too. I memes. Like. No real significant concerted effort, no brand building, but there was headlines sporadic on social media. And The Onion did some. I think The Onion has like a Youth of Today story in mm. their legacy. Um, I think uh, I heard Ric Flair say something, which was, <laughs> uh, it was about his, his n nickname, the Nature Boy. And it was, um, he actually got it from another guy. There was another Nature Boy in like this regional pro wrestling circuit huh. that Ric Flair was a part of. But when you say the Nature Boy, everyone thinks of Ric Flair. And someone asked him about that, and he just said, it's not about who did it first, it's about who did it best. And I think that a lot of people think of themselves as original thinkers and as people who come up with these interesting and new ideas. And uh, I don't think most ideas aren't new. Yeah. And so I don't really know if it had anything to do with the idea, but I think it had to do with the execution. Mm hmm the idea that we were going to create a website that website that looked professional that had a consistent uh publishing schedule that had less typos than you would expect <laughs> that had uh photos that were passable and had a, a staff of dedicated people ready to to passionately put time into the project uh, rather than one guy throwing out headlines um that i had organized it like a actual editorial newsroom rather than uh, just pure chaos. So it was, I think it had existed, but no one had done it in a way where it was so presentable mm -hmm. that it could be a national or worldwide thing that punks and hardcore kids around the countries could relate to. Yeah, um, Every scene had their funny guy. Uh, There's a lot of zines that were doing punk comedy, um, but there wasn't, someone who said you know what every single day there's going to be an article on on my website that's going to be for these people there was nothing very dedicated like that and i think we were the first ones to make that super passionate concerted effort and have a level of quality that was like passable yeah so i would say it probably already did exist but we just didn't see it because it sucked <laughs> yeah um that makes a lot of sense, just kind of you, the cohesion of it, finally. Because punk, in its many values, is not known for cohesion and presentability. Right. Um, well, it's interesting. So I, that was stuff I learned from journalism. Yeah. Hard Times is all about journalism mixed with punk. So it's like a zine, open submission process. Uh, so most of our, almost all of our editors and writers, almost all of our editors don't have college degrees or writing backgrounds. And a lot of our writers are the same way. They're just people from the music community that are really funny. Um, and so it's definitely a weird experiment. But at the same time, we, we do have some structure. Yep. And that comes from me working in newsrooms and trying to set it up in a similar fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it's like, a, it's like a chaotic punk vibe, but also it actually runs on schedule. It's not on punk time. You know what I mean? It could this is this is a bit of a stretch, but it's almost like nine two four Gilman. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, except for uh, Green Day doesn't cut us checks whenever we start running in the red. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they will now that they got the book. Yeah, maybe Green Day hit me up. <laughs> um, so you've mentioned before, and I'm equally interested in this about the diversification because I remember when Hard Drive was announced, uh -huh. and I was like, oh, this. I was a bit worried that it would be, you know, kind of dilute the brand oh yeah um and i remember like when consequence of sound which i did enjoy for a while when they announced that they mm -hmm. were like doing movie reviews and then it just went downhill from there mm -hmm. uh, i was like oh i was a bit worried but all the content has been excellent and i've and it doesn't feel like each either brand has been diluted at all which mm. i've been very happy with and it's really funny because 
I'm someone who's both into video games and punk music and a lot of variety of things. Um, and I feel like a surprising amount of people are, and we kind of overestimate how much people section themselves off into music fans or mm -hmm. video game fans or film fans or whatever. Um, but it's really funny because I'll have friends who don't know anything about music send an article or a, mm -hmm. a headline from um, Hard Drive and be like, oh, this is really funny. Mm. Um, and I'll, I'm like, oh, this is the, this punk website that mm -hmm. um, That's had great. really in jokes. And then these video game in jokes are coming and um, other friends are getting it. And it's really funny to see this kind That's of great. coalescing of things. Yeah, you know, um, so hard times started popping off. A whole bunch of people started reading us, and I immediately wanted to start a video game website. <laughs> that was like maybe six months in. I turned to my co-founder and I said, we should do this, but for video games. And I wanted to model a little bit off of Vice, which I was writing for at the time, and they had all these verticals they had like noisy which i was writing for yeah. that was like their music thing but they had like broadly for women all this sort of stuff and i thought i wanted to create like a satire version of that network of sites and video games was the first one that i chose for whatever reason i didn't get around to it for quite some time and i actually tried a conspiracy theory website and then a mma and pro wrestling website before that both of those completely flopped um but i just i'm kind of type of guy where i just try really hard at things and i try to pre prepare, prepare for success, put the resources into it, uh, get strong teams behind things. Um, but if they don't work out, just kind of pull the plug on them and let them die. <laughs> and so I had to do that a couple times, but I didn't stop and I kept going. And uh, then we got Hard Drive, which that one landed really well with our audience. And I think Hard Drive, you and I will hang out in a couple of years and it will, Hard Drive will be, I would say three or four times bigger than Hard Times. That's, sure. that's the growth pattern. Um, it's a very, very strong brand uh, that's growing uh, with a lot of green grass ahead of it. I think most punk or hardcore people have heard of Hard Times. Mm -hmm. They might not like it, but they've probably heard <laughs> of it. And I would say less than 1% of video game players have heard of Hard Drive. So there's just these huge opportunities for us to continue to grow and spread. And the fact that your friends are sending you this website and you're saying, wow, I, I remember when they were just writing jokes about their van being stolen outside <laughs> the, the venue or whatever. That's a really great thing. I thought, you know, some of our fans were worried that it would dilute the brand, but I was actually pretty significantly surprised um, by the amount of people who actually really enjoyed it. Um, and it really was, we didn't have a big fan revolt yeah. because when hard drive first started, we had to pump it up through hard times. We had to let people know that we were doing this thing. So we had like, you know, a million punk fans and we were sending them jokes about Kirby. <laughs> and I thought there might be a little bit of a revolt there, but there really wasn't. And I think that that is a testament to the strength of the jokes that hard drive was putting out. Um, and now hard drive has grown so big that we no longer need to, uh, force it on our music fans, uh, which is also great. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's interesting though, the thing you said about, you know, you were worried consequence of sound was going to do mu uh, movies and, um, you're worried that hard times is going to do video games. One of the things that I've learned while running this website is that punks aren't just punks. Yeah. Punks have to pay their taxes. Punks have to make <laughs> dinner. Uh, well, they don't have to pay their taxes. I mean, a lot of them don't. Uh, <laughs> punks have to go to work, although a lot of them don't do that either. Um, but they live lives. Yeah. And they encounter the world. And so you can satirize society at large just with the perspective of someone who went to basement shows. It doesn't have to be just stuff that happens in the basement shows. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the heart of our website and what we're trying to do. Um, but yeah, Ace Watkins 2020. Do you know Ace? I, I've yeah. seen the Twitter a lot and a lot yeah. of out of context again. Yeah. Um, which I actually want to talk about because I've noticed a lot of times I'll see Hard Times articles and, or Hard Drive or Ace mm -hmm. kind of completely out of context, out of the rest of the things. And sometimes people do that annoying thing where they crop out like a mm -hmm. logo or something. Mm -hmm. I feel like that happens a lot to the Hard Times. And I'm curious... Obviously, I, I I can assume that you're not a fan of that. You want your credit to or your credit where credit is due, but uh, you know, yeah, I do. But we we've, we've taken some steps. We put watermarks on the photos. That's a 
it used to be that if you went directly to the website and you screen capped it, there wasn't a watermark. But we changed that. So if you go directly to the website and screen cap it, there is a watermark. So if you see someone who posts one of our things and there's no watermark, that means they actually went out of their way to take it out, which is very bizarre. <laughs> but you know what? I don't really care. I think it's um just a consequence of making a lot of jokes on the internet that some people are going to steal them, and uh, especially if they're good. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of a compliment in a way. And I've seen it happen a lot. I just think we're just, I think we're influential. That's that's all. Um, if people want to copy our jokes instead of writing their own, I think that says more about them than it does about us. And uh, a lot of people see our stuff and a lot of people go to our website. It's not really a, a major concern of mine. You know? Yeah. If they want to be a bozo, let them be a bozo. <laughs> Sometimes it's fun to make a stink on social media about it because people love when you make a stink about anything on social media you stole from me you've harmed me you must hate creators i don't know people love drama yeah. on twitter like here, here's 15 tweets in a thread about how i was robbed <laughs> of my creativity Every, that's like the biggest narrative that people enjoy is that you were like a i think it's because we can all relate at the end of the day yeah maybe yeah that's a good idea yeah it's like we've all been victimized before so we just love the victim narrative or we just all love to think of ourselves as the underdog more. Yeah, we're all the underdog. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're all the one who's getting screwed over. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually really tried to kind of rid myself of that mentality. Yeah. I don't like to think of myself as um, powerless. Anytime I see people doing that, I just it seems like they present themselves as powerless. Mm -hmm. And I know that sometimes we are powerless, but... I don't like having any ideology that demotivates me. And I feel like that's really prevalent in punk and the nihilism of it. Instead of embracing the nihilism and being like, well, we might as well try because it doesn't matter anyway. It's more like not, um, we might as well not try because there's no reason. And yeah. I, I, I don't know, which is so bizarre be considering how political so many bands are um, and how direct they are saying, like, do this, believe this. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it goes even further than punk. I mean, I think it's just a, yeah. a lot of people see themselves as, I mean, especially people our age, I think, speaking broadly, how old are you? Uh, 22. All right, we're, we're in yeah. the same demographic, man. Yeah. I'm not that old. I'm not that old. <laughs> Please, college listeners, I'm not that old. <laughs> um, Hello, fellow kids. I feel like people in their 20s, there you go, so I yeah. broadened it a bit. Nice. People in their 20s, they have a lot of ideologies and belief systems that are very negative very powerless uh like stuff just like oh what does it matter because global warming is going to kill us all yeah like i might not even have a kid even though i want one because global warming is going to kill us all and oh uh, what does it matter i'll never get out of student loan debt and uh you know oh the bosses they just they're going to screw us over no matter what and i, I have no chance you know uh, people don't like me because I'm this, and so I would never be able to do anything. And um, even if some of those things are true, I really don't think they're very helpful yeah, to believe agreed. deeply. Maybe to be aware of them and try to circumvent them when possible is good, but like I started my website with um, $800, and it there were some really difficult times Um but you can do things, and you should always be trying to do things. And uh, if you want a kid, you should have a kid. You know, I, I feel like there's just a lot of people who really, really buy in deep with the whole notion of, well, it doesn't matter because I'm never going to overcome. Yeah. It's very sad. And, people and, shouldn't believe that way. And a lot of the time, I feel like it comes from the more privileged among us instead of the people who are actually struggling the hardest. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's pretty dominant, like meaning like it's kind of across the board. For sure. Uh I don't know, it's a weird thing. Um I think entrepreneurship is a very powerful thing. It's helped me a lot in life. Uh it's a very freeing thing starting your own business. Um and not the fantasy made up version of it that people talk about where like, oh, you get to be your own boss, you get to make your own hours. All that stuff's like a myth. All that means is that you work 24/7. <laughs> um but there's something really, it's like almost like a biological deep thing, at least in me, 
where it's like getting to create your own stuff and steer the ship yourself and go the direction that you feel is proper. And when you have an obstacle, you're the person who gets to decide the solution is so powerful and so freeing. And I wish more people would take a shot at it. You don't have to risk everything, right? You don't have to, don't quit your day job. I mean, I worked on hard times while I had a day job for years. Um, but I feel like more people should get a creative side hustle that they really dedicate themselves to and feel that power. Because before I did hard times, you know, um, I feel like I had less belief in myself. Yeah. And people around me had less belief in me. When I said things, they would shrug them off. I, you know, my ideas were not considered. They, <laughs> I was just a kid saying whatever. Yeah. Now when I say stuff, people listen. I know that sounds weird, but it's like they listen. I'm, if I say, hey, maybe we should do this sort of website, people go, hmm, Matt thinks we should do this sort of website. Maybe we should. <laughs> and that's like a really encouraging and powerful thing to have in your life. And you can get there through entrepreneurship, and it doesn't take that much money. It just takes a little bit of time and burning the candle at both ends. And whenever I talk to people, I always, if they start talking about their creative work yeah. and their creative passions i always encourage them to own their own thing yeah like go own your own thing um but yeah rant over <laughs> andrew hamilton is embezzling <laughs> money from this school can you guys believe it i, I can't believe it i can't believe it either because it is not true and when i was satire, satire when i was in a uh, college i started a big feud with the the president of my uh, school we have a few going on at all times yeah um we are a lot of people are not a fan of anything to do with this school i'm just realizing that i got in a feud with um my high school principal <laughs> some of my high school teachers no wait middle school principal <laughs> high school teachers college professors i had a huge public blowout with one of them then i got in a like public thing with the president of the school and then at work when i went to sf weekly i got in a huge thing with our publisher that ended up in the cjr which is like an industry journal yeah. so i just i just apparently i have a bad attitude man i gotta, <laughs> I gotta cool down a little bit <laughs> i think it seems like you've cooled down a bit at least but also yeah. like probably they were doing bad stuff maybe i don't know probably not they're probably just doing their jobs you know i feel like they college, didn't they probably. didn't want me to wear a studded leather jacket to school they thought it would be a weapon really i, I said shut the fuck up and everyone here is carrying a big bag of 30 pound books yeah. that you could swing at someone and you could kill them. I'm wearing studs. <laughs> and then they said, well, you could wrap it around your fist and punch him. I said, well, then I, I was such a little, I was an idiot. Talk, <laughs> talk about privilege. I demanded a meeting with the principal of the school. <laughs> and um, they, she, I said that uh, all the girls were wearing white studded belts. That was the fashion at the time, but they had no problem with them. And I said, you just don't like it because you think I make the school look trashy with my punk outfits. <laughs> She got fired later, not for, not because of that. She um, was she embezzling. When she was in that meeting with me, she said, "What if someone did this?" And she wrapped up my denim vest, which had studs on it, around her knuckles, and she kind of like very slowly, not threatening, pretended to hit me to kind of like show me that, like what yeah. she thought could happen. I remember thinking it was a little weird, but I don't really care. Maybe a couple months later, she's in a meeting with another kid, and I guess that kid brought like. I don't know, a toy gun to school or something. I don't know. But she pointed either gun fingers or a toy gun at him and said, like, bang, bang or something. <laughs> and it, she got in a bunch of trouble. She had to step down. Huh. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about that. I, I don't I don't like any of it. <laughs> Me either. Um, so we should probably plug the book as we're wrapping up. Um, Which book? You have a book? Um, it's Moby Dick by... Herman Melville. Yeah, it's the Hard Times by Charles Dickens. <laughs> um, there's a Hard Times book coming out. Um, I yeah, gotta take a brief look at it. Um, it's it's a, kind of a parody of these punk history books. You know, please kill me. Our, our band could be your life. And hey, this guy gets it. Am I right? I'm walking over here. I've been saying <laughs> yeah, that the whole time. I'm in New, New York. York. Hey, I'm walking over Have here. You slammed any cars? Yeah, I just like slammed the hood. Hey, I'm walking over. You know what else? Dude, in New York, I've never felt so at home anywhere 
as much as New Yorkers feel at home just walking around the city. <laughs> they walk into bagel shops and they yell over the counter, hey, everything bagel, everything locks bagel. And the guy whips it up real quick and he flips it over the counter and the kid catches it and starts eating it. It's like, did that kid even pay for that bagel? What the hell's going on? I'm like standing in the wrong spot. Like, you got to order over here. You got to order. I'm like, uh, can I order online? Is there an app for this? I, I'm, man, I, uh, I'll never be as cool as New Yorkers. <laughs> it's just not in me. But our book... It's the type of book where you can throw it on your coffee table and you can open up any page of it and get a hard times headline and a laugh. But at the same time, if you want to read it front cover to back cover, there's actually a narrative in there that tells the whole story of our hard times, which in the book says it was founded in 1976 and tells you a whole story about our editors, our founders, the different offices we uh, lived in. And uh, I'm really, really proud of it. It's very dense. There's a lot of material in there. I went to a Barnes and Nobles to go check it out because we're at every Barnes and Nobles and every like almost every independent bookstore nice. of note. And I went to go see it on the shelf because I thought that was a cool moment. The books it was surrounded by, oh man, did they suck? What was it there, surrounded by? There's so many like it's in like the humor section, so it's, it's not like, in the music. It, it, no, no, that probably should be. But it was like oh, ten. Trump tweets turned into poems. <laughs> and then there's so much white space in these books. Oh, it's like the Rupi Kuar kind of effect. I don't, dude, there's, this is like a, such a good scam. Yeah. You just, you get this advance from a publisher and you turn in a book that's like a hundred words. Yeah. Like, and it's Trump, all stolen content. Yeah. Too. Oh, yeah, it's all just re. Wasn't, what, Vine and Honey? Wasn't it just, or like. I don't know that one. It was like just Vine quotes in like pages of white. So literally. Just, a day it probably took to make literally a day and you know they got advances for them oh man yeah. it, i just realized i saw our book next to those other books and i go oh i was just supposed to scam my publisher but <laughs> like a moron i got a team together and we worked on this thing for like a year and it's like we combed over every sentence making sure yeah. we would make 10,000 headlines. We only put a hundred of them in there. You know what I mean? Like we, Jeez. this is like, we're trying to present our very best yeah. selves. We're thinking we're building a monument to this magazine that we've created. So it's got our greatest hits in there, but it's also got like a whole half of it is new content. No one's ever seen before. And like, we tried so hard on this book yeah. and there's like illustrations and, and little subplots and remembrances. And then these people next to us, they probably got paid the same amount of money. And it's just like, what if Trump was a chicken? <laughs> Five illustrations. <Yeah. laughs> That's like the title of some of these books. What if Trump was a chicken? And I just imagine these people like going on like the Tonight Show or whatever, promoting this huge smash hit. I just I need to. You need to be a grifter. I need to start grifting. I'm too earnest. It's horrible. Just like join like Kurt Eichenwald and the. Well, I'm trying to grift, but you're trying to stop me. I was trying to get like a right wing conspiracy theory radio about <laughs> Andrew Hamilton going, and you were. No, that would be more of a left wing. At, at well, NYU. either whatever wing pays more, baby. <laughs> I don't care. I think I know which wing pays more. Which? Um, I would assume the right. I think if you're independent, right wing grifting pays more. But if you're trying to go mainstream, oh, the left wing grifting. Oh, if you're if you're talking about like the Kurt Eichenwald, Ed Krasensteins of the world, I'm talking. I'm saying extremes here. Yeah. There's no. I don't think Noam Chomsky, or maybe Noam Chomsky is, but I don't think any anyone influenced by Noam Chomsky is making the big bucks. There. Okay. Here's the thing. You can be left wing, super boring, just like the most boring, lame Twitter politics of all time, and if you grift hard enough, you can get like a weekly show on Netflix and that's like a pretty good payday. Like you can grift your way to, it's like the fake mainstream success. Like no one actually watches the show. Like that's like the equivalent of the grifted books where it's just like 10 Trump tweets. But that inc that requires all this like institutional support. You have yeah. to like navigate. Now if you want to do right wing, all you need is a microphone and to say a whole bunch of bad but words. Also they have, I mean, all those people are funded by institutions on the right wing. Yeah, like the Mercer family, like all those sorts of people. I need a right... Okay, if you're listening to this and you're a right-wing billionaire and you want to <laughs> change hard times into just being this uh, vehicle for hate, and uh, you let me know. Oh, I've thought uh, about it so many times as, like, you know, the college leftist, and then I could be like, oh, I saw something I, terrible, and how much money I can make if I had said I saw something terrible in, like, college, PC, campus, or whatever. Yeah. 
And I just was like, oh, man, it was so terrible being a part of this. And I could make millions. And you're always the guy who's wait. Are you saying you're the guy who always stood up and tried to stop it? And you're going to become a fake left wing grifting hero? No, no, no. I'm saying I'm saying you're going to turn your back on the left wing. You're going to turn my back as like, you know, a uh, heel turn. Yeah, exactly. I can make so much money so easily. Yeah. Well, go for it. What's stopping you? Morals? (laughs) Come on. (laughs) You got to see these books. After this interview, I'll take you to Barnes and Nobles. I'll show you these books. You're going to. It'll, you oh, have I've to make seen, this heel turn. Them. I've seen them. Yeah. Um, we got to get into grifting, man. Bill, I saw the Bill O'Reilly book still on the shelves of Barnes & Noble. I went in yesterday, um, literally, to a Barnes & Noble, and, like, on display was the Bill O'Reilly book. And, like, just because he says Trump is not the greatest thing ever, he has, like, a book deal, even though... Wasn't he accused? He was accused of stuff, right? Yeah. Oh, a whole bunch of stuff. And he paid him off, so they kind of... That's a kind <laughs> of a pseudo-admitted to it. Um, yeah, that's what... I just wish I was, like, Trump's, like cab driver one time get like a million dollar advance being like inside the <laughs> hateful mind of my worst taxi drive ever <laughs> it feels like everyone around him is writing a book he was actually i went to ufc last night at madison square garden he walked oh in. yeah everyone booed i saw the video or half the crap booed yeah you know not as much as the you know they didn't game. really boo okay so i booed and i also flipped him off and i felt like he saw which was really fun um it felt it sounded like this it was like boo usa usa uh, usa uh. and then his sons came in and he stood up again and he was waving and there there's a decent amount of cheers there, there was also a guy next to me tried to start a like fuck trump chant and some guy next to him who was much bigger than him kind of touched his arm and said hey sit down man uh-huh. and then he said like it's new york like that's the whole thing there's like it's like people will, they don't always look at him as a political figure, I think. I think sometimes yeah. they go, that's our guy. That's our New York guy. Yeah, uh, and uh, also, you know, UFC is, they yeah. admire tough guys, and Trump wants to be a tough guy. So uh, it was not, I saw some people on Twitter being like, wow, man, they destroyed yeah. him with booze. Eh, yeah. Not in my section. Okay. Yeah. There was yeah. A, there was some people who were marking out. They were excited Trump was there. I mean, not as much as when The Rock came out. <laughs> But they're, they're saying boo earns, boo earns. Exactly. No, there was. A, I was disappointed because then there was then there was people who were trying to boo him again. Like there was a boring fight going on. It was a great night of fights, but there was like one fight that was like kind of boring, and people were trying to get like a fuck Donald Trump chant or like a they were trying to get like a his attention and boo him. But there were people with, with mega hats and people were chanting USA and Donald Trump and they were cheering him and he would stand up and wave. Hmm. A lot of people liked him. On that note, yeah. I have to get to a meeting, but it was a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. I wish we could talk more. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate I, you taking the time. Of course, of course. Um, so if you are, if you enjoyed this interview, if you enjoy the Hard Times content, you can buy the book at any almost any book retailer. Um, yeah. We also have a website that lets you lay out all the independent bookstores. Nice. Yeah. So, you, uh, so it's right on our normal website, but it's the hardtimes.net backslash book, and it'll show you all the indie bookstores you can buy it at. And uh, yeah, buy from an indie bookstore if you are interested. Um, if you don't buy from oh, you're in New York if you're listening to this. We were just we had an event at the Strand, nice, and uh, we signed a couple copies. And I think they told us they're putting them out on one of the main tables. Ooh, I might have to go pick one up. So, yeah, um, that that would be pretty cool. It's defaced, the value (laughs) value goes down a couple bucks every time I sign something. So, um, yeah, so thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. It's called The Hard Times, The First 40 Years. I, I got the joke. Yeah, thanks. It's a black flag joke. The best joke in the book, my personal opinion, <laughs> is the, alert. is the dedication. Yes, for your um yeah. for your mom it said. Yeah, it says uh I didn't write the joke. It said uh to my mom who finally gave me a fucking Pepsi. What is that reference to? Is it just Suicide of Tennessee's the oh, song yes, uh, yes, institutionalized? Yes yes, 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 yes. This is how we should end this interview is we should play that song for these people. Institution- Can you play is Institutionalized it, it by Suicide of Tennessee? Oh, we can't play unclean stuff. Hmm. No, probably not. Okay. Well, we can do it as an I outro. I can play. I can play the instrumental at least as the outro. The perfect. The the or the intro or something. Perfect. That's how we'll do it. And cutting into that now. Thank you for listening, Violets W N Y U. Eighty nine point one. Eighty nine point one. Andrew Hamilton and Bezler. <laughs> uh, allegedly, possibly not actually, satire. Thank you for listening. <laughs>